become a follower of Jesus, assuming that you are? Uh, how did you first learn about Jesus? When did you first really, I would say, encounter Jesus? Of course, not in the flesh. That's not possible, but by the Holy Spirit. And when did you then say, I really want to commit myself to be a follower, to give my life to him? That, that's a process for, I think, everyone. Uh, when we read this story, it sounds like Jesus saw these people and he said to them, come and follow me. And they did it without ever having known him before. Some people will say, well, what's that look in his eye? And I, no, no one really believes that. They knew of him. They had heard him probably. They were aware of him. And this was the culmination of what they had been observing and experiencing along the way. And now he sees them at work and he says, follow me. The first disciples, Peter and Andrew and James and John, are all fishermen. There were three types of fish, and there still are in the Sea of Galilee. There's more than that, but the three that are commercially caught. One is like our sardines. It was the food of common people, fat and bread. And then there was a fish like carp, called a bar, because in a bar, well, you know, catfish uh, and carp have that. And then the other is what we would call today tilapia which uh, there is called St. Peter's fish for another chapter and incident in the scriptures. I've eaten St. Peter's fish. Uh, the one I got, there wasn't a lot to it. It was pretty small. I mean, you eat the whole thing, head and all. So. Um, fish were caught in three different ways with hooks. Uh, I'm talking about commercially. And they were caught with nets, a casting net. And that's what is mentioned here. And then there's another kind of net, like a seine net, which uh, has weights and it's thrown out by using more than one person. It sinks to the bottom and you pull it up and you, you catch fish in there. Fishing was a, a fundamental part of the economy, the agrarian economy, really, of that part of the world. Uh, a lot of people lived in villages, fairly good-sized villages, or around the Sea of Galilee, and this is what many of them did. Often the fishermen uh, lived at a subsistence level. They were very poor. Some had more wealth. Evidently, Zebedee had hired men, so his business was a little bigger and more profitable, perhaps, than, than that of Peter and Andrew. We don't, we don't know. But they were all fishermen. They were working guys. They were virtually uneducated. Origen, who was a church theologian in the 300s, said it's preposterous from the world's point of view that those without education could be used to instruct nations. It's a truth. <laughs> you may remember in Acts chapter 4, the members of the Sanhedrin, the council, were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. And they could see these two fishermen. And they could see that they were ordinary men who had no special training. They also recognized that they had been with Jesus. Some of my heroes in the faith, some who I still know who serve so well, are in the world's eyes generally uneducated. Now they were self-educated. But they're very effective people for Christ. Uh, the key to being effective for Christ, I don't care what your education is, I don't care what your background is, is to be with Jesus. That's what marked out these folks. It was noticed that they had been with Jesus. And the next one called is a tax collector. Now, there were three different kinds of taxes in that time. We recognize them all. The poll tax, the estate tax, the land tax, and taxes on imports and exports. The taxes were all collected. Those taxes, there was one for the temple, 
but there were taxes collected for the Roman government. It was oppressor. It was an occupier who was collecting the taxes. The Roman government hired local people, recruited local people, Jews, to do the actual collecting of the taxes. They were assigned them out to collect. They collected that, and they added on to it for themselves, and whatever they added on could be bigger and bigger, and no one could really speak against it. They were despised by the rest of the people. They were the lowest of the low. Even their families were despised. You may remember that parable which Jesus tells about a story about two men that go up into the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee, the other's a tax collector. And the Pharisee prays this way, Oh God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. Robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like that tax man. That was the class in which they were put. Robbers, crooks, adulterers. I don't know how you look at yourself. I don't know how you look at others who God has called to be his own. Not always the best, not always the most pure, not always the most lovely. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter, verse, chapter 1, verse 26. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, speaking to the church. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not. To reduce to nothing things that are. So that no one might boast in the presence of God. He's the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let no one boast, but let him boast in the Lord. And then Jesus said to these people, follow me. That's unique because usually the rabbis and my followers are saying, follow the Torah. I will teach you about the Torah, but follow the Torah, follow the law. Jesus said, follow me. He makes it personal. That's the commitment in Jesus Christ, is to follow him. That commitment is total. You'll notice each time it said they left something. Immediately, Peter and Andrew left their nets and followed him. James and John left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired hands and followed Levi got up, left the tax booth, and followed him. Leaving, leaving, leaving our own will, our own stuff, as it were, to follow him. Abram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, where I'll show you when Abraham went. We're told in Hebrews it was by faith that Abraham obeyed and went someplace that he didn't know he was going and he never received it after he got there. Faith is trusting in Jesus Christ to set our destiny, our reward, our purpose. And we have to leave the other stuff behind. And that's not just for these special people that we're referring to here. Jesus in Mark chapter 8 called his disciples and the crowds that were listening to him. And he says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you're going to lose it. If you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you're going to find it. How do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul in the process? Is anything worth more than your soul? Jesus said. I have to feel that many have sold their soul for power. They sold that so evidently. 
For all of us are called to leave our own wills, our own purposes, our own stuff. Even our own family, if they get in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ, to follow him. And that calling, of course, affects our life. We're following him, which means we're, we're committing ourselves to be like him. Without the Holy Spirit, that's not easy. It's impossible. Then we see Levi at, at his home, having invited Jesus to come, and there's a meal. At, and at Levi's call, Jesus sat at dinner in Levi's house, and many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. The interesting wording here, is it suggests that at that dinner, Jesus acts like the host. There's a differential, a, a, a dif I'm missing the word here, and, uh, to see him as the responsible one, as, as he seemed always to be. Everybody defers, that's the word I wanted, defers to him. And People are upset. Look, look at that. He's eating with these, these sinners. He's eating with these tax collectors. We always talked about, already talked about tax collectors. The sinners were people who were outcasts. They were people who weren't being moral. They weren't following the law. It, it was a, kind of a, a surface kind of thing, but that's the way they were looked upon. The point is, that it's a very diverse community sitting at that table. Sinners, outcasts, tax collectors, the most despised, these fishermen. That's the church. That was the group that Jesus called to be his followers, his closest followers, the twelve. You talk about a cabinet of rivals. This was it. You had Simon the Zealot. He's not mentioned here. He wanted to overthrow by force the government. And Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, or my, my followers would fight, but it's not of this world. And then there's Peter and Andrew and James and John, these fishermen. There's Matthew, who was a tax collector. But all of them have to be together and work together. And by the way, it may very well be, since they all lived in the same area, Matthew's a tax collector. James and John and Peter and Andrew are commercial fishermen. That Matthew is collecting taxes from those people. And now they're together as followers of Jesus, this despised guy who was taking their taxes and much more than he should have. And now they have to sit at table together. They have to work together. Boy, that's a wonderful image of what the church has to be, is called to be. Follow me and I'll make you fish for people. You're called to serve. You're called to follow Jesus. You're, you're called to do what Jesus did. To say, repent, the kingdom of God is near and you need to do the things that are done in you. And proclaim the good news. That's what Jesus did. That's what they were called to do. You can notice later on when he, in the book of Acts, when, or this uh, Luke chapter 8, chapter 10, I'm sorry, when he calls out the 70, that's what he says. You go preach that the kingdom of God has come near, repent, tell the good news. I count myself as a sinner called by. Jesus Christ, not because there was ever anything good in me or is anything good in me. It's all of His grace. And He calls me, as He calls you, to serve, to be a fisher of others, caring about other people, wanting them to know the one you know. I think we do that most effectively by our relationships. People have to know us, have to see us, have to appreciate our values before we can ever probably tell them the good news. 
That's what we're called to do and to be. I think all of us, and I hope you heard, what Jesus is saying to you by the Holy Spirit, follow me. I've called you. I've called you to the purpose. I've called you to a destiny. I've called you to serve. I hope you can sing the words of the African American spiritual, which Fran and I both love. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You may have all this world, but give me Jesus. Lord, only by your Spirit can we live out your call to follow you, to serve you, and by serving you to serve others by being like Jesus. We ask it by the power of your Holy Spirit, the glory of the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord.